Um, I'm very happy and grateful to be here. I promise to start with a joke that the talk bears no relation whatsoever to Peter Urban <laughs> or his particular aesthetic preferences. So <laughs> we have a focus on things that are actually outside our windows at the moment. So really appreciate the location as well that we can actually just turn, turn our heads and enjoy the urban aesthetics of Prague here, here today. But my talk today uh, will be about um, urban aesthetics in general. This is an area in which I have been working for the past 15 years or so, uh, since the beginning of my doctoral project and then continuing to doctoral work and so on. Uh, and my way of characterizing this uh, particular subfield in aesthetics uh, always kind of follows the idea that uh, urban aesthetics is a lens, it's a way of bringing together the approaches in environmental philosophy and in philosophy of technology. Of course, other areas are also important and interesting, but we are dealing in urban environments with things that are brought here by human intentionality, uh, by human design. But then there are also um, facets in urban life, in urban environments that are not in our, in our power, not uh, something that we can control or design. And this kind of friction is something that characterizes urban aesthetics to a, to a large extent. Uh, this will be the outline of my talk. So first, I, I hope you can see the text might be a little bit small, <laughs> but I will be talking all the things that will be on the slides. So at first, I give a little bit of motivation. Why do we need to look into urban aesthetics in particular? And then some background. Where does this particular approach stem from? What are the ideas behind the scenes, so to say? And then I move to describing a current paradigm in urban aesthetics. And this is something that I've been working mainly in recent years. Of course, some other partic particularities as well. But like how to characterize the study, the philosophical study of urban aesthetics. And then in the end, I will give some examples of how we can apply these approaches, uh, how we can go into, into particular cases, case studies. I do that through my own recent publications. I hope they are of interest, but I will also present uh, some of my colleagues who actually come mainly now from the philosophy of the city research group circle. So people work on urban aesthetics also in that uh, very, very interesting and vibrant community. And with the applications, we also touch upon the future directions of the field. And um, yeah, if in, in the end of the talk you have any, any interest, if this somehow links to your work, I'm very, very happy to hear comments and, and questions and, and your ideas about urban aesthetics and what it could be. So motivation, I think this is something that we all kind of are familiar with already. So the parallel processes of urbanization, growth of human population, and very kind of grave uh, conditions for this are taking place at the moment. I mentioned here climate change, but it's only one of the major problems that we have worldwide in a way. Uh, already uh, over half of the human population lives in urban areas globally. Uh, and by 2030, the urban population will be close to, 50, uh, to 5 billion. So this already gives us uh, a lot of motivation to study the effects of urbanization. They do not concern only human life on Earth, but also other species well beyond our, our intentions and conditions. But in order to study cities, like we can have several different kinds of approaches. But to me, of course, coming from the field of aesthetics, understanding human aesthetic preferences and values related to urban en environments are, are really, really of interest. And they also, also kind of provide us a way of uh, understanding other values. And that is, I can already tell, that is like a, the red thread in my talk, that aesthetics is a vehicle, it's a way uh, to also grasp other values and how we kind of make them perceivable. So if we start with the urban life world, and this is a concept that I find particularly useful, it is uh, familiar, of course, from the context of phenomenology, but also something that has been used in sociological studies of urban life also. Uh, with the idea of urban life world, we do not focus only on the material conditions, but also the social structures, the interrelations between different facets uh, of urban life, what there is in the city to be perceived in the first place. Uh, and I also want to emphasize that we very easily tend to think in terms of Western cities and uh, Eurocentric cities even, what kind of uh, aesthetic ideals. Uh, do we have about what is what what does uh, our preferred city look like and we I'd like to keep it very open 
that um, cities globally have very different qualities, but also our aesthetic preferences when it comes to cities can be very different. So we are somehow dealing with the urban life world and in aesthetics particular with uh, senses, with sensory information, sensory uh, in a way knowledges. Uh, also it's a way of kind of showing how imagination is part of uh, urban experiences, what, how we make sense of the urban life world, how our memories and emotions also have an effect on how we experience and what we value. But we also have to take into consideration the social and political factors. They determine aesthetic values. Uh, we are not only individuals. Aesthetic taste is not purely subjective, although that is a very intuitive idea that beauty is always in the eyes of the beholder. It is also that, but we also are very, very much directed in our taste, in our preferences by communities, diverse communities, which we are a part of. Uh, by taste that kind of develops as part of our experiences when they accumulate and trends. So there is also change in aesthetic preferences. Uh, city is always uh, as a location of study. It's characterized by diversity, by constant change. Things are always in motion. We only have to walk to the street and we understand this on many different levels. Uh, there is a great variety in the amount and quality of stimuli in the lived environment, so a lot of things happening. And this can be, uh, and has actually in the history of kind of urban uh, studies been also criticized that cities are like too over overwhelming for our senses. And, and uh, cities for some time were considered to be like a necessary evil, like a byproduct of industrialization, something which would and could not provide an interesting or livable environment for human beings. But on the other hand, cities have always been also places of fascination, of really kind of uh, something that energizes humans uh, through precisely this variation and, and amount of stimuli. But then we cannot also um, like overlook the questions of who can use a city, so whose city are we talking about, who, who is this subject in, of the aesthetic experience that I will be also talking about, uh, what kind of uses are actively or passively prevented by urban design, for example. This is becoming an increasingly important question and also points towards the idea that urban aesthetics is not uh, innocent in that sense. So uh, what we sense, what we perceive, how we evaluate that uh, already points towards certain usages and, and also things that we cannot find in the city tell a lot about the uh, like, uh, existing values of the community. So, uh, yeah, I promised to briefly mention also philosophy of the city. It's a very interesting and important context for urban aesthetics. Um, it offers, in a way, this kind of uh, multi inter transdisciplinary context for studying aesthetic values, aesthetic experiences uh, in the urban context. And this is uh, really just a short introduction into philosophy of the city. If you are not familiar with this branch, uh, it's uh, to s some extent uh, now kind of um, you can, you can find, find philosophy of the city done in the context of our research group. I'm a member uh, of a co-director in the board, but of course as a branch of philosophy, as a sub-branch of, of applied philosophy, you can find it uh, in many, many, many places. Uh, and the idea behind this um, approach has been to kind of uh, give, like somehow respond to the criticism that cities have been a blind spot in the context of 20th century environmental philosophy. Uh, this is something that has come up especially by, um, uh, from, from Andrew Light in 2001. I think he was one of the early environmental philosophers to, to really address the problem of cities from the environmental philosophy point of view. Uh, but it has also become a, a very kind of positive, vibrant, very kind of free context for uh, bridging different approaches within philosophy. So there is this interdisciplinary approach, but then also this intradisciplinary focus within philosophy of the city. So if we have in, uh, in our, like under our attention uh, cities as philosophical questions, we most likely need uh, all these different kinds of approaches to, to kind of solve the pro problems or to answer the questions that we might have. And aesthetics in this context is one of the approaches, which is, in my opinion, of course, I'm a bit biased, but it's, it can be very useful in making visible uh, ethical problems in cities, um, social, political problems, and, and whatever you might, you might find. Um, 
And yeah, so then we come to aesthetics. I'd actually like to ask from the audience, I'm not going to ask any details, but how many of you are like feel, would feel comfortable using the word aesthetics in your everyday, everyday talk with your friends? Do, would, would you use the word aesthetics with like comfort? You can mean all different kinds of things by that. I'm not asking for a definition. Uh, because I think aesthetics is quite uh, a loaded word. Um, you can mean, mean uh, a variety of different approaches uh, by it. So I want to make clear what, what I mean by aesthetics and in, in the particular context of urban aesthetics as a, as a philosophical field and approach. So um, this links to some developments, uh, especially within environmental aesthetics, in everyday aesthetics that have taken place in the past, I would say, 50 years or so, everyday aesthetics more prominently since the late 90s. And the idea behind these very, very kind of applied approaches in aesthetics has been to return to the original definition of the discipline of aesthetics. So Baumgartinian uh, definition for aesthetics and aesthetics, uh, especially as the science of sensitive cognition. So this really basically means that we are not interested only um, in art, and in the urban context this would mean public art, which is a very important and interesting topic in itself, but it, presents only, it represents only one domain of interest for urban aesthetics. So first of all, there is uh, interest in the realm of multisensory experiences. So it's not visual only either, but we, we really try to focus on how different senses contribute to the urban, urban aesthetic experience. But if we would stay only on the level of sensory experiences, we might be coming from perceptual psychology or something like that. We are philosophers, we are ultimately interested in how these experiences and perceptions are linked to human values. So how we make and give meanings in the urban context for the things that we sense and perceive. Uh, and art, of course, it's, it's, it's one domain of interest, but this is like a step back from the Hegelian definition for, for aesthetics as uh, kind of narrowing it into philosophy of art. Instead, we are open to all that there is to be experienced. And as you can already understand, this opens a lot of doors for, for <laughs> like topics that you can study uh, under the title of urban aesthetics. I also always propose a scale model of aesthetic value. This is a very kind of useful um, trick for thinking about aesthetics. Uh, aesthetic in itself is not necessarily a positive, uh, doesn't refer to only aesthetically positive qualities, so we are not only discussing or equating aesthetics with beauty. Beauty is one aesthetic quality, but we can also be interested in ugliness, in repulsiveness, in some, something simply being like interesting for our senses in the urban environment. And the scale model means that uh, beauty and ugliness, they are not perceived as opposites, but they are actually on the, on the one, one side and what, what is on the other side of the, the, the kind of sliding scale, if there exists one, that would be maybe something that doesn't even um, gain our attention, something that we don't pay conscious attention to. And there are also those kinds of things, of course, in the, in the city. And this kind of resonates with uh, recent emphasis on as in aesthetics and, and other philosophical fields uh, on attention as a topic. So there are a lot of things kind of fighting for our attention in cities. Based on our personal experiences, we might be noticing certain things and our friend might be noticing completely other types of things. And I think this also creates a lot of variety between subjective experiences in cities. And in my personal opinion, I think this, this comes with the profession. Beauty is one facet, aesthetic beauty in particular, but to be honest, I find ugliness often much more interesting, or even in the urban context. So we get into much more kind of complex grounds when something is perceived as ugly. And aesthetics, in any case, it's not only about the surface qualities. Uh, we are not de dealing with facade aesthetics. That is one dimension but we're trying to get, get beyond those immediate sensory perceptions. So we are interested in deeper meaning-making processes and the kind of ensuing values and what we make out of those values. And this is sometimes referred to as the thin and thick sense of aesthetics. This uh, distinction comes from John Hospers in Philosophy of Art, but was applied to environmental philosophy by Alan Carlson. And as a motivation, further motivation, but also as a as an kind of definition maybe for aesthetics, it's uh, an important part of quality of, of creating quality of life for people uh, and of human well-being. And Arto Hapala has been writing more about this particular topic, how aesthetics contributes to human well-being. 
So if we move now more closely to, to urban aesthetics, uh, how we can approach this obviously quite broad field is that we try to zoom into how the look and feel of a city is studied from the experiential perspective. So again, not only visual experiences, but the feel, the atmosphere, the, the kind of when you just grasp a place somehow and it, it, it kind of touches you and you makes you makes you imagine, makes you dream, makes you like gives you some kinds of emotions and, and interesting ideas. And another distinction uh, that is especially useful in the context of urban aesthetics would be the descriptive normative aesthetics um, distinction. So in urban aesthetics, uh, we can easily imagine just by reading tourist uh, books or, or like introductions into cities, the descriptive side that there might be like just somehow like follow, following like what, what there is in the first place, not necessarily saying if it's good or bad, if it's beautiful or ugly. Uh, and then the normative side in a way tries to already go deeper into explaining, finding uh, arguments for why something should be there. And this, is, um, this distinction maybe helps to, to kind of already see a little bit where in research, for example, where we are working. So I see both sides useful and I also see that it's very actually difficult to, to make ex exact distinctions between the descriptive and normative, but in some cases it can be very, very helpful. And when Mark mentioned, for example, that I have been working as a consultant in these fields, uh, I, I tend to go somehow, the processes move from descriptive to normative, but you have to kind of base your ideas why cities should be developed into certain directions and, and kind of deal and discuss with uh, several stakeholders, like who the changes will affect. So when it comes to aesthetic values, uh, we discuss what is considered to be beautiful, ugly, interesting, important. Uh, there are, are like a variety of different qualities, uh, basically the adjectives that you can use to describe a place in a city. So you can imagine that there is a lot of vocabulary that could be used here. And interestingly, the vocabulary also develops and changes all the time. One of my favorite new development uh, that kind of I discuss with my students is that when, when we talk about vibes, like certain city, like uh, an environment has a certain vibe to it. And it's like, it's not exactly the same as the atmosphere necessarily, but it has like just a certain feel. And when you talk with your friends, um, they, they also grasp, but it can be very difficult to pinpoint what creates a vibe in an urban area. Uh, and we can come uh, to, to quite closer to an analyzing urban aesthetic experiences also by focusing on different roles and interests of the experiencer. I don't like the word experiencer, but like, <laughs> that is sometimes very useful to explain this. So we can zoom on the tourist gaze. For me, for example, it's the first time in Bra Prague, so I, I have maybe certain expectations. My attention goes to certain landmark monuments and so on, so I'm very kind of easily distracted by things here. But if I would live here, I most likely would really pay attention to very different things. And they all kind of can belong to the category of aesthetic experiences. Uh, and also like professional view. So if an urban planner, if an architect uh, looks at the city through the professional lenses, those ideas are also very, very valuable, but can point to very different directions sometimes. And this is where conflicts also get born. Uh, a little bit about the philosophical background. Um, besides uh, philosophy of the city that I already presented a little, uh, the recent developments, I would say since 1995 onwards or so uh, in urban aesthetics uh, come, they stem from cognitive and non-cognitive approaches to environmental aesthetics, everyday aesthetics, phenomenology, a little bit different branches uh, depending on, on who, is, who is writing about urban issues. Pragmatism has been very influential also through uh, developments in both environmental and everyday aesthetics. Uh, Post-phenomenological philosophy of technology, I have been especially kind of trying to link those views into urban aesthetics. And then the aforementioned philosophy of the city, which is more like an umbrella term for many, many different kinds of approaches. Uh, now we go into the kind of um, framework. And this work I have done during the past years in order to kind of make sense of everything that has been written uh, about urban aesthetics trying to go even beyond the disciplinary boundaries of philosophy and understanding how urban planners have used the word aesthetics whenever they use it, or, or architects, and like into what kind of uh, directions these uh, ways of using the words simply point towards, how, how we can make sense of this kind of uh, very, very muddy field <laughs> in a way, make it, make it clearer for further, further study. Uh, and I like to... Um, 
like use this, this division or distinction into three different dimensions or layers uh, of urban aesthetics. And the first one, I think this is what is very intuitive, uh, intuitively grasped about urban aesthetics. So that may be a bit clumsy term, macro aesthetic layer simply refers to those ideas that we enjoy cityscapes, we enjoy beautiful facade buildings, we um, somehow focus on the visual emphasis of an urban environment. Uh, this is when we pay a lot of attention to, to these surface and formal qualities, uh, which um, this and also very kind of instant, um, instant uh, impressions of a new place, for example. So this is linked to the tourist approach of, of uh, coming to a city for the first time. It's often somewhat distanced from, from the city as a, as a location itself. Um, and we maybe pay our, uh, more attention to landmarks, uh, different monuments, cityscapes, recognizable features. Uh, I like to use as examples the cityscape of New York City. It's something that almost everyone from the, at least from the Western cultural sphere, recognizes immediately. So we have already a lot of ideas that we kind of attach to that, that image, even as a photo. Uh, or the city of Paris, uh, the, the Eiffel Tower, such an emblematic place in the city uh, that everyone, everyone who has ever heard about Paris most likely recognizes. And then linking it to the, the next layer, uh, when we are like in here, we are looking at the, the object or the, the kind of cityscape from afar. Uh, we try to link this into more everyday, towards more everyday experiences. But if you look from the aesthetic theory, from everyday aesthetics, this, is, this kind of dimension of urban aesthetics is linked to extraordinary experiences, so something that kind of breaks or is not part of our everyday understanding of our life in the city. And art can also be part of this, uh, very, very often is a part of this, but art actually is something that uh, goes through all of these different dimensions of, or layers of urban aesthetics. So it can have different functions, even the same works of art. And the other dimension, when we actually zoom closer into the city and into these everyday experiences, uh, I've titled that micro-aesthetic layer. We are somehow closer to the object of study or the environment of our study, or like uh, trying to understand the uh, implicit and explicit experiences that everyday life kind of brings, brings to us in the urban environment. And although there is always a strong visual emphasis for us as human beings, there is more emphasis maybe on multisensory experiences. We are on the streets, we are walking, we are maybe in motion, we are not discussing cities through images, which is also one, one possibility with the, the, the previous layer. We are actually kind of engaged, taking part in the urban processes. So other senses, you can imagine going to a city where, the, where there is a particular smell, or you can uh, see the, the um, feel the, the cobblestone below your feet. All these kinds of experiences come, to, come into play. Um, but yeah, this is uh, something that links to everyday aesthetic understanding of how we also use city. It's not there only to be perceived as pretty or ugly or anything, anything beyond that, but it, it really becomes experienced in the context of uh, everyday routines, everyday rhythms, everyday activities that characterize our life in the city. And I think this is very important because this is a way of approaching those very, very kind of... Um, even the most implicit aesthetic experiences, uh, something that you might uh, face uh, on a daily basis might be a very kind of minor detail in the city, but when you see it on a, on a daily basis, uh, it actually starts accumulating. You are maybe, maybe kind of noticing things for the first time only when you pass them for 50 times or so on. So this opens a lot of possibilities that are not necessarily there for the, for the kind of more grand scheme of aesthetics. So this distinction that comes from everyday aesthetics is very useful for analyzing these kinds of phenomena. So the ordinary, extraordinary, this would also, of course, kind of go towards the ordinary experiences or like things that we consider ordinary, even too mundane to be aesthetically appreciated, yet they have an effect on us. This is one kind of claim that I always make in my work. And this is why we should be talking about the living environments, the neighborhoods, the sub suburban um, kind of living conditions for people, uh, even though we wouldn't be interested in how they look or feel, it still affects us if we live there. 
And then another distinction is um, linked to ordinary, extraordinary, but also useful here is familiarity and strangeness. So how these kinds of things kind of fluctuate fluctuate in our experience and in the context of very, very familiar, uh, your own block, for example, you think you know everything in it, but there are always strange things, always new things coming up for your experience as well. So it's kind of this kind of fluctuation between what you already know, what you can expect, but then something that penetrates the experience also all of a sudden or more subtly. And in this context, like the same artwork that can be faced by a tourist as a, as a kind of grand scheme of aesthetics, something obvious for your aesthetic appreciation, the same work of art in the urban context can also um, become significant in the flux of everyday life. Like, for, for example, I always think uh, in my own personal life there is a... Uh, one very kind of strange monument, like a statue, <laughs> uh, put to, to a square. And I pass it daily, at least twice a day. And it kind of becomes part of my everyday life and routines. And I sometimes I think of it, sometimes I look at it, but most of the times I just pass by. Yet it's still there. It somehow creates the aesthetic kind of um, undertone for my everyday life. And this is a term that we have used with uh, Vesa Vihaninjoki in some of our articles. So it's kind of what is what there is, we might pay attention, we might not even notice, but it creates the, the atmospheric factors maybe. And this one is still in a way work in progress to some extent. Oh, sorry. Um, but something that, that I have been kind of going towards, because the macro and micro, they, that, that is something that is quite clearly found in research literature. Like you can make the distinction and kind of make like group, or almost like group texts on urban aesthetics based on that, that division. But it seems that there is something more uh, for us to experience. And also we need to link what is the connection between the macro and micro dimension. The, the, it's, it's never either or our experience. It's most likely like we zoom in, we zoom out, we see the big picture. But then there are a lot of things that even for tourists that, that like small details that we might pay attention to and so on. Um, and it's a work in progress in a way. I titled it Experiencing Urban Complexity. But to me, it's, it's somehow related to the uh, kind of many, many intertwined complex uh, ways of functioning of contemporary cities. So, um, and I'm not only referring to the megalopolises of, of our current century. I think it's something scalable, this experience of urban complexity. Uh, it's a pro product of many, many interlinked processes and we are always part, we are always engaged somehow bodily out there um, to, to just name traffic as an example. We are participating, we need to kind of somehow make sense of the many signals of the cars. Uh, also when we are using, using transportation methods, for example, a topic that I discussed in Japan last summer, uh, it's a way of experiencing the city in itself. So we, we see a different city or different facets of the city when we are driving a car or when we are walking or when we are um, taking public transportation. It enables different things for our experience. But this could be a possible way of explaining also differences between uh, 21st century cities globally. I just wanted to mention, again, remind that we don't go into these two Western Eurocentric ideas that cities are always somehow product of certain time or age uh, or function in a certain, um, to us, logical way. Uh, there's a very, very interesting book on messy urbanism uh, in the context of East Asian cities, uh, which kind of um, describes the logic um, of, of cities um, being born from very kind of different conditions in a very, with a very different logic than, than what we are used to. And uh, that can really have those kinds of aesthetic experiences or enable aesthetic experiences that wouldn't be possible in any other place. But when it comes to this, this like terrain of experiencing urban complexity, I think uh, it's fair to say that this could be a way of grasping more closely the temporal dimensions of urban life. So not only are we always experiencing the city on a, this kind of temporal continuum, the experience is not never like just single take and then we move, move um, along or like live our life further, but it's something that kind of surrounds and, and, and we are enveloped by the city in a way. So it kind of keeps continuing. Uh, and of course, the temporal dimension also refers to the fact that if we discuss the macro aesthetic dimension, cities are evolving, developing, there's always some renovation going on. 
which uh, in my opinion it's, it's actually quite funny that we always think that renovation or maintenance activities in cities they are temporary when actually it's something that really characterizes the city. There's always something going on. <laughs> like it just changes place and the city is never ready. That is something very, very much um, uh, like, like Akhile Varsi has, has written, the city is always like a process and we have to grasp the process nature somehow. So we can maybe get closer to understanding also the systemic level of a city, which is like maybe goes, we usually think that it goes beyond the experiential perceptual sphere. But we can get glimpses of that um, by, by simply taking the metro, we, we get a glimpse of the, the, how, how the city as a system works or how this particular uh, infrastructures or transportation uh, methods work, even though we can never perceptually grasp the entirety of the system. Uh, but we, we can get like um, some, some ideas, and I, I use the word that the uh, complexity of the urban system, it kind of seeps into our everyday experience through these manifestations. So from our experience of the metro, we can just grasp and with the combination of looking at the map that the system is vast and we can never, never grasp nothing, like nothing else but just a tiny bit of it at, at the same time. So this kind of um, experience of awe or like feeling even like small in the face of the, the magnitude or the systemic nature of the city, I have termed that um, through the concept of the urban sublime. I find it very useful. Uh, so the sublime in, in itself is a very traditional concept in aesthetics. Again, I'd like to ask if you could use the word sublime naturally, like easily in your everyday conversations. All the time. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm... Not in this sense. Not but, a, but in general, yeah. Like people say, for instance, that uh, drink is sublime or mm -hmm. something. Which is yeah. Not yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it again has like a variety of different uses and I, I, I like to always just observe. I'm not saying that anything would be like more right than other, other version, but I see that it's less used than in, in like aesthetics. I've done this same survey many, many times and always with the same result. But the sublime, like kind of knowing, recognizing that it has some aesthetic, heavy philosophical baggage to it, it's also very useful. Some facets of it are very useful. And we just had an article coming out with Britt Strandhagen from uh, NTNU in Norway and Matti Tainio from the University of Lapland on this topic. So Britt basically went through some like the traditional ideas, Edmund Burke, uh, Immanuel Kant, and then, then we came towards like the kind of newer, um, very useful definitions for the sublime, mainly through the notions of technological sublime and urban sublime, which have both been used already before this, but we, we like to like really apply it to, to urban aesthetics in the, in the new, new sense. So we, we found that this could be one way of explaining those, those instances that have certain, have very kind of distinct aesthetic dimension to them, but which are not simply explainable by the traditional uh, conceptualizations of urban aesthetics. Just briefly before I go to the uh, examples, I think I'm supposed to move towards the end of my talk soon, but I really want to emphasize this point. And I, when I in the beginning said that uh, the main red thread of the talk um, is in a way that aesthetic values make other values perceivable. So we really want to zoom a little bit more to aesthetic values, uh, how we discuss them, how we kind of try to handle them in urban aesthetics. Um, I uh, also reminding the kind of background in environmental aesthetics, um, a very kind of pragmatist um, originating ideas of aesthetic experience as a form of engagement. So somehow being bodily, not only bodily present, multisensorily present, but also present as a citizen, as an active agent in the, in the kind of, in the urban activities, but also sometimes like kind of losing your power. You, you know, when you're part of the, the group of people uh, proceeding on the streets, you don't always uh, kind of feel that you're fully in control of these experiences either. Uh, and urban aesthetics, um, how all these, these three different levels, uh, what is kind of common to them in a way, and the ensuing experiences of those, those places, those facets of cities that we, we kind of uh, feel and see, uh, we can say, I've been stating this in a, in a recent article of mine, that um, it's characterized by compromise and imperfection. And I mean that this on many different levels, it's, it's if we look at cities as architectural 
uh, constellations of, of things designed by humans or if we look at uh, specific aesthetic features that have been planned and designed. Even among those, there's always some kind of compromise going on. If we look at the inter- or transgenerational perspective, like we are always living with the remnants of previous generations, we have to somehow make sense of them. It might be through changing the city radically, it might be by preservation, by conservation, but it's something that we need to deal with. We don't necessarily have a say. We cannot build our cities from the scratch unless we play a video game or something, then, then it might be possible. Uh, but then also the ensuing experiences are kind of characterized by this sort of uh, compromise and imperfection. We have to live uh, with other people. We have to also kind of um, follow, follow the ideas that others have put forward. Uh, we don't always agree with, with the ideas and or with the kind of uh, concrete formations that, that come, come up in our, our neighborhoods. And it's this kind of very con contested area in itself. And this actually links to very recent uh, discussions in, well, in the Finnish context, I have been kind of participating sometimes a bit against my will because it's a very, very um, in, uh, like a flammable <laughs> terrain, uh, like the, the kind of fight between traditionalists in architecture and then the preservationists and then like people who would like to have like more diversity in architectural styles, for example. And um, this, is, this is something that how to live, actually aesthetics can be a way of understanding how to live together with very differing values. Uh, so it's, it, it's sometimes like an easy way of entering some very difficult discussions about differing political values or differing ideas about what good life is in general. So it's not as innocent as it looks like. Aesthetics is like one thing that I always like want to emphasize with my students is that Aesthetics is very often considered to be this kind of cherry on top value that you can think about aesthetic things about beauty when everything else is in place No, it, I, I don't think it goes like that I think it's really ingrained in what it means to be human what it means to live a good life What it means to kind of come together with others and and, and support and also like kind of live with differing opinions uh, Yeah, but this kind of imperfection um, and, and this kind of tolerance towards diversity is very very much uh, in um, in, like central in, in the current discussions around, around how to develop cities. And I guess it's not only in the Finnish context, but more broadly. And aesthetic appreciation besides the sensory knowledge, perceptual knowledge, also requires uh, having quite a lot of knowledge about the processes that produce and maintain these aesthetic features in cities. So we might take a simple example that actually links to philosophy of art very closely. If we look at the building and we recognize the architectural style, if we even know the architect, if we know the material uh, which is used in its building, uh, the more information we have, or like I was kindly given some insight into this area um, when we entered the building, like about the events that took place in front of the building, and all that kind of adds to my perception of the space. It's something that I link to my immediate perceptions, and we humans do that by our very nature. Um, there is like the, the pure, like pure perception is, is maybe an illusion, like it's something that we already, already tie a lot of interpretations into when we, when we are, as, as we are perceiving. And this is an idea that very, very closely follows some ideas in more general environmental aesthetics. So urban aesthetics is part of environmental aesthetics, but really focuses on, on the urban environments. And, and this in itself brings focus to very kind of different questions. And questions, uh, in a way, um, the kind of Kantian ideas of aesthetic as a disinterested domain, that we, in a way, should somehow only put value on aesthetics and, and leave other values somehow somehow, at least momentarily, like outside our aesthetic judgment. So we can maybe claim that it's, it's, it's technically, it's like somehow in theory possible to distinguish between aesthetic value and treat them separately. But as we are living in the hustle and bustle of the city, I, I really, really kind of say that it's a very useful way of understanding that we are all the time um, affected by the knowledge, by the other information that we receive about the things that we are perceiving. So aesthetic values in the urban environment, they are linked to other values, ecological, ethical, economic, uh, you name it, what, what else we read. Uh, for example, from buildings, we can deduce a lot of the kind of social structures behind its construction, who, who are the people living in it, who are the people using certain areas. Uh, these kinds of uh, things are easily read and kind of make, make uh, us maybe interpret places in a different way, whether we are accepted, whether we can use the street, whether it's safer to go by car and so on. 
And one term that is linked to this understanding of aesthetic values as very interrelated with other values, it uh, comes from Cheryl Foster from landscape ecology, uh, aesthetic disillusionment that actually has its origin already in Immanuel Kant's philosophy and kind of uh, re referring to the moment when we receive some kind of new information of the, of the object of our appreciation. So, for example, if we appreciate a certain building style very much and then we learn that it's actually super energy, um, like wasteful to build it, to use the material, we, we might still appreciate it aesthetically, but it starts eroding our appreciation slightly if we are really thinking about the ecological side, as we should. So here you can see how the normative side is entering into our perceptions and kind of uh, aesthetic values. Um, this is something I claim in my, in my work and others have done as well that they start slightly changing. Sometimes they can change overnight, like you can really, really like see an immediate change, something that you perceived as beautiful, like really starts con like looking ugly when you know what is going, behind, going on behind the scenes. Uh, what are the costs for environment? What are the costs for other people, for social justice, for example? But sometimes it takes longer time and it can take even generations. And this is that change, this temporal processes is like now in the center of my current research projects more. So it's still a very much work in progress in a way. But we, we can say that uh, aesthetic experiences in the urban context, although they are very often immediate, there is that side, very much so, uh, we tend to somehow function based on this sort of informed aesthetic judgment also that we, we already know, especially if it's a famili familiar environment, we have more and more detailed information about what is, what is there, there and why does it look the way it does and why is it, is it the way it, it is. So now I go into some concrete examples, uh, just a few, few more minutes if I have time. Um, these are from current research collaborations. Um, I'm very kind of excited always to talk about 5G aesthetics. It still makes me like smile a little bit. <laughs> Coming from the humanities, from philosophy, from art studies, to talk about 5G was a, was a stretch. But it actually started as a kind of um, spin-off project from my um, ERC starting grant proposal, which didn't get funded in the end, but got to the final, final round. Uh, and I pro proposed this idea of studying aesthetics of new urban technologies, and I, 5G was one of the examples. Yeah, I didn't really know a lot about what it would entail, but I had a hunch. Sometimes it's good to follow your hunch. So in the end, we um, collaborated with Delfina Fantini van Dietmar from the Royal College of Art. She's a uh, design researcher and got really, really excited on the topic. She's been working with smart technologies, uh, both in the home context, smart home, but smart city as well. And we organized a, a workshop as part of the London Design Week in 21, in the middle of the deep pandemic. It was supposed to be on site. We were supposed to go on location to see these 5G structures, uh, the small cell towers, uh, all the supporting systems and edifices that you need uh, in order to enable 5G, which in London are, and in many other cities, are very, very visible. But like in London, we would have kind of traced those back. But it, it, ultimately, it was an online workshop. We worked based on, uh, on photos and we were able to kind of, um, or we, we like first had like a lecture part and then the second, second part of the workshop was focusing on reimagining uh, these new infrastructures and really kind of going beyond the current paradigm of thinking about how to, how to um, implement, how to install uh, structures and, and like kind of um, elements that are needed in order to enable 5G or 6G, as I learned, most likely will be the next step immediately. And yeah, after the very interesting and fruitful workshop, we then uh, collected, uh, we also had like another, another part or like a round table that you can actually find, find online with these experts uh, who then also um, contributed to an edited um, volume or edited dossier in Media Police Journal. Journal of Cities and Culture with kind of very inter interdisciplinary approach to urban cultures, uh, cities. Um, and yeah, we named it the, the rise of 5G. And with 5G aesthetics, like you could focus on what 5G as a technology kind of enables. So you can maybe uh, like uh, use entertainment, you can watch stream videos uh, in the bus, or you can like really somehow have more profound cultural experiences. You could use VR and AR for um, urban design or like somehow for urban art purposes. 
super interesting, super important kind of insights in that direction. But we really went to, to the kind of root, um, what, is, what, is, um, what are the methods of enabling these technologies? So we were really interested in like, how does it make the city change? Uh, like, like the immediate change in cities and what kind of structures are needed. So, so we did a lot of that kind of, of research. And if I just main, uh, briefly, briefly uh, go through the main insights, um, in the US, it's very common to like use camouflaging tactics. So people uh, send us images of, of these um, small cell towers or, or antennas that were ma masked as something else. So uh, you might have seen images of like palm trees or trees which are actually like fully technological systems, but just like uh, mask must be to look like trees or they were painted with the same color as the wall, or you could even see like this brick, brick uh, color painted onto the, onto the structures. Whereas in Europe, we tend to make things like more visible that you can actually see and trace that this is a new addition. It might come from our preservation, conservation kind of practices and principles that like it's, it's not about hiding the technology, but at the same time, it has to be replaceable. Like it's, it most likely will be replaced with a new design, with a new, uh, new installation in a few years. But these kinds of differences came out and then we discussed in the, both in the workshop, in the round table and in the dossier about how these structures are kind of affecting uh, ecologies, uh, different species beyond humans, of course how they're affecting humans. For example, from Stoke Newington in London there was a discussion with uh, local people, local elderly people who like didn't really know about the technology at all. What is it? What do, do they need it? Not necessarily. But the direct consequence for them was that the place where they used to sit by the park was taken up by these like five meters of different um, electric like cabinets or like systems that you needed in order to kind of make the, make the um, network work in that area. Uh, yeah, and actually, yeah, you can maybe see some of the titles, but you can also also just go and read the issue. I think it's very, very kind of nice collection of ideas. Uh, and uh, with 5G, what we also discuss is kind of all, all kind of conspiracy theories, which are, are out and out and about. So it's kind of one part of the of the one one side of the phenomena, one very interesting side in a way. Uh, and then we, inside our group of people, we also had like techno optimists, techno determinists, but we also had like techno skeptics and, and like people who really want to reimagine things and question, like, do we need, for example, 5G or 6G in each area of the city, or would it be possible to have like sanctuaries within cities that in the park you might not need a network at all, or like you focus only on hospital areas? or libraries or universities and such. So this kind of, maybe we were mainly criticizing that this kind of discussion is not, not there. We just assume that this technology is, is needed everywhere. So that was one, one dimension. And as you can see, hopefully, from how I explained it very briefly, that aesthetics was actually just a way of kind of entering these very, very complex discussions around the technology and how it affects people. Uh, but a very different approach to, to many of the, the ways in which it is, it is discussed. So there is something immediate if we talk about perceptions, if we talk about beauty, uh, the very kind of weakness of aesthetics that it's subjective, it's in the eye of the beholder, it actually can be a very strength when trying to involve people into discussions and into trying to understand what is going on. And this is an ongoing project. Uh, this is a... Um, uh, European, New European Bauhaus project, Horizon funded uh, Palimpsest. It's led by Politecnico di Milano and I'm part of the advisory board. I have been very, very happy to follow the process like from the early stages of applying for funding and now, now really the selection of different artistic designerly practices to, to kind of uh, reinvigorate areas in cities uh, which have been left left like without attention for, for too long times. And it might be about industrial past, such as in the case of Woz in Poland. And then there is another place in uh, Heras de la Frontera in Spain. But I have been mainly focusing on um, this uh, Lambro River in Milan and how it, we, we like first um, had a competition, selected uh, winners uh, who will now workshop with the local residents in June in, in, in the Lambro River area. And, and really kind of trying to both 
gain some attention, that, that there is some, something needs to be done to the, to the places, uh, but also already pointing towards direction in which art and design can be part of, of, of kind of not only making problems visible, but actually solving, solving some of the issues around the area when it comes to not only residents, but like the, the ecologies more broadly, and in this way linked to the broader development of the area. So this is very, very much ongoing. But I, I especially like how the project from the beginning has interpreted um, aesthetics or beauty, which is one of the kind of three key words of New European Bauhaus initiative, uh, which still kind of refers uh, very often to the direction of using, using art. And art is used also in this process, but it has a broader um, kind of take on the, lands the landscape change and the landscape kind of uh, it comes from the, the, the landscape architecture uh, department at, at the Polytechnico. So this kind of richer understanding of what contributes to aesthetics in cities. So you might, might want to follow the project if you are interested in this, this direction. Also wanted to show, I added, because I received just uh, yesterday or today, some like the cover of the new book uh, edited by Mark and Mark. <laughs> From Vienna, uh, I had the pleasure of, of uh, contributing with uh, a chapter on aesthetic values in the maintenance of urban technologies. So the maintenance topic is something uh, not entirely new to me. I have been interested in care, in the topic of ethics of care, aesthetics of care in the, in the urban context. But maintenance really, really ties to the temporal dimension of cities. So what kind of decisions, how do you make decisions about aesthetics uh, when thinking about maintenance, when thinking about sustaining things towards the future, or sometimes even abruptly changing them and like going into completely other, other kinds of directions. Uh, and we also have actually with, with Mark Thomas Young, the special interest group on uh, maintenance and philosophy of technology. We have a meeting tomorrow. If anyone is interested in, in joining, just let me know. I can add you to the mailing list. It's fully online events uh, on a monthly basis. We discuss different issues around maintenance and philosophy of technology very broadly taken. It's part of the Society for Philosophy and Technology. And then other two quite recent articles that I kind of discussed in the talk earlier uh, from the uh, Oxford Handbook of Philosophy of Technology, edited by Shannon Valor, Urban Aesthetics and Technology, just a kind of brief overview how the, these two issues link, mainly pointing towards new directions. And then in the middle, urban experience as aesthetic compromise, so more related to kind of um, everyday aesthetics. Uh, the uh, edited volume by Peter Chain. And that text is actually being translated into Japanese, but now. Yeah, so if I come to conclusions uh, and future directions, uh, emphasizing that this is my take, someone else talking about urban aesthetics might have different ideas about the future directions. But if you trust my expertise in the field, um, I would say that the, the, the normative underpinnings, uh, we still have a lot to work on those in a way. What does it entail both to the, the kind of practice of urban aesthetics, to the philosophical side of it, but how we can also employ this as a kind of tool or method for approaching not only other values, but other pra practices uh, which have actual effect in the urban environment. So urban planning, architecture, uh, infrastructure, engineering. Uh, what, what does aesthetics mean in these different domains of making urban life? Urban ecologists, really like people who, who work, work on, on maintaining uh, different facets of urban nature. What does it mean for a conception of urban nature? Uh, but I have kind of characterized that the, um, we need both the kind of interdisciplinary uh, going beyond the, the boundaries of philosophy to a certain extent, um, kind of bringing and bridging aesthetics to other fields. Uh, we still need to see how aesthetic dimension kind of communicates, and this refers to the descriptive side, and how it on the other side facilitates the normative side to the development towards, first of all, just, inclusive and diverse cities. And this is something that I see uh, happening in the work uh, of Quill Kukla, for example, in the work of Robert Rosenberger, uh, just mentioning very, very few. There are others, of course, but from the philosophy of the city, city uh, group in a way. Then secondly, multi-species urban aesthetics. I mentioned Thea Lobo, Taylor Stone here, here, really kind of focusing on those sides of uh, the ecologies, interlinked, interwoven, 
uh, developing very kind of hybrid ecologies that form a very, very important part of our urban aesthetic experiences. Uh, and then thirdly, sustainable and post-carbon urban futures, of which uh, an example, as an example, I see the, the Palimpsas project, for example. And this is something that, that is taking place very often in connection to sustainability scientists and, and people who are actually kind of taking, putting these uh, sustainability transformations in, into motion. So as a final comment, uh, what is like I, I've been emphasizing throughout the talk, once more, uh, what is valued aesthetically in the urban environment is, is linked to other values, to say the least. Uh, and I, I always kind of go towards stating even that aesthetic values really makes other values perceivable. So not only what there is to be perceived tells us about choices of other people in other times, in our times, but also what is lacking. So we also need to go into thinking and imagining further how our cities could look and feel, what kind of elements would serve the purposes of not only us, but also future generations of humans and non-humans alike. But now I only have um, mentions of some of the recent works which you can find on my website. Please feel free to email me if you want uh, copies. Sometimes they are not accessible as easily as I would wish. And yes, this is, this is where I want to end. <laughs> um, you're very welcome to, to um, uh, submit your articles to Philosophy of the City Journal if you work with anything that has to do with philosophy or the city. So you can see that we have a very broad scope <laughs> and a very efficient and very kind of transparent and nice editorial process. It's a journal that I founded with Ryan Wittingslow from the University of Groningen. Uh, it's the official journal of our research group and we just had our inaugural issue coming out last October and the next issue, the deadline was just a few weeks ago and it will be on cities at night, so nighttime cities, and it will be out in the end of the summer. But thank you so much. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>